We're going to continue our series this morning in 2 Peter. We're going to read verses 12 through 21, and this will be the continuation of Peter's admonition and encouragement to the church to maximize their lives for the glory of God. And he's telling them now some of the reasons that they need to be paying attention to what he's been saying. He says, For this reason I'll not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things, even after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased." And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke is they were moved by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the passive pursuit of God's appointed paths for our life must come to an end. Don't you hear me say that again? The passive pursuit of God's path for our lives must come to an end. We can no longer be passive. In this day, we cannot be passive in our pursuit of what God has for His church. It is time for believers to become passionate, even driven, to see our lives becoming maximized for His glory. This is our hour. We need to step up and stand up and be counted for the kingdom of God like never before. I would like to lead us in another song, but I'm not. But I would like to. If I was going to lead us in another song right now, the song that I would lead us in would be the song that all of you know. We used to sing it in, what what do they call it, rounds? You know what rounds are where one sings, one sings, one sings? What's the most familiar song you know of that we would sing in rounds? Everybody knows it. Row, row, row your boat. Now let's, let's get the words of that song, the theology of that song down, because it's the theology of much of major Christian evangelical church life today. Ready for it? Row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. That is the mantra of most modern day Christianity. That's how I want to live out my Christian life. I just want to row, row, row my boat gently down the stream. Well, I want to tell you something. If that's what you're doing in your Christian faith experience today, you need to turn around. Because Christianity is not going down the stream if it's doing what God is calling us to do today. Christianity is going upstream. We're going against the current if we're adhering to what the Scriptures teach us that we ought to be and do. We can't live that song in our Christian life. We can't just gently row down the stream. That is not our Christian life any longer. And we need to understand that. We need to step up and accept that reality. We need to embrace that truth because we can't do it anymore. The church has got to stand like never before. Right now, maybe not right now, maybe a couple of hours earlier out in California, maybe right now there's a church, there are churches that are facing all kinds of fines, even closure, even potential utility shutdowns because they're meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think that if they can't keep that going there that they won't try to bring it here. Folks, it's time for the church to step up. It's time for the church to stand up. It's time for the church to embrace the calling for which God has placed us here. This is our hour, and we need to get with it. So, Peter is talking to the church about 
a life of effectiveness in his kingdom, lives maximized for his glory. And so what we need to understand is that a life that is effective is a maximized life, and a maximized life is a life that will be effective. So effectiveness on the faith journey, what does it require? It requires the constant pursuit of character transformation on our part. That's what Peter's been leading the church into. He gave those seven aspects of character transformation that need to be implemented, instilled, poured into our lives with constancy. And he says that you need to do this. You need to add this to your life. You need to add this to your faith. You need to keep pouring these things into your life. And you need to live these things out. Remember what they are. Knowledge, self-control, uh, pa- perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, all these different things, virtue, they need to be added into our lives. And he says these are what, what formulate the Christian character that counts in the world that we walk through. Now, I want you to understand something. We may be walking through some tenuous times. We may be experiencing some pushback related to our faith. But we're not experiencing anything compared to what the church that Simon Peter is writing these words to experienced in his day. They were, they were called to lay down their lives. And I know that happens in some parts of the world even now, but it's not happening here yet. So we need to understand that whenever Peter is using these, these words to lead the church of his day, that he's speaking to them in times when things are harsh toward the church. So if they were important to them, they're important to us. And we need to allow these things to be placed into our lives. And then in verse 12, Peter says, there's a reason that I'm telling you these things. Now, I want to show you something. We have the fact that effective living is what Peter's all about in front of us, and he reinforces his instruction in verse 12 through 15 by saying there is a necessary accountability that is asserted by him. Y'all know the idea of accountability, right? It it means that you're going to be held responsible for what you've been been given what you've been been handed and so there's this accountability factor that shows up here and I want you to see this because this is this is every parent's dream for scripture and instruction for their children notice what happens here in verse number 12 Peter says for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things now that, that's a good verse for parents to memorize in talking about things that they want to instill in their children. I will not be negligent to constantly remind you of these things, right? You want to tell them, I want to tell you this over and over. Then look at what he says. He says, even though you know, even though these are things that you know about, and even though you're established in this present truth, it's my responsibility to keep on reminding you. And then he says it again. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. (laughs) So, again, every parent's dream, you have scriptural authority to keep telling them over and over. But that's not through. That's not done. He says, knowing that surely I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things, even after I'm dead. That's what Peter's saying here. He says, I'm going to tell you. While I'm here, then then I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you again because I think you really need to be reminded of this. In fact, I'm going to tell you so many times that even after I'm dead and gone, you're going to remember these things. So he says, I'm holding you accountable. I'm giving you a sense that you're responsible for what I'm telling you. You need to pay attention to what I'm laying out in front of you. In other words, he's saying, this is important. Pay attention to it. So Peter's saying, I will hold you accountable, and you can believe that I will because of the urgency of these words, these teachings. So accountability is an essential part of Christian development. But but what what is he basing all of this important language on? Where is he going from here? He not only tells us that there's a necessary accountability, but then he says there's also a necessary awareness that is essential for the church to have. This is, this is where he gets real. Look at what he says, verse number 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he goes on from there, but I want to stop here for just a moment. I tell you that there's a necessary awareness that's essential, and there are two things that I want to tell you that we must be aware of as believers right here, right now. The first one is this. 
We must have an awareness of the world in which we live. We've got to know what the world looks like. We've got to know what the world thinks like. We've got to know where the world is going with all of their, their, their ideologies and their philosophies and their thought processes and their perspectives. We've got to get a sense of that. And, and whenever Peter says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables, the implication is that there are those who have. There are those who've generated cunningly devised fables. There are cunningly devised fables out there. And he'll talk about that some more in chapter 2, and we'll talk about that some more when we get there. But we're going to talk about it a little bit this morning. So I don't want you to think that we're going as deep as we need to go in this today because we need to talk about these cunningly devised fables because this is the, the essence of the perspective and the mindset, the philosophy, the ideology the way of the world in which we live. They have generated so many cunningly devised fables, and we need to understand what that looks like. What are cunningly devised fables? Now, they take a lot of different shapes, but I'm going give, to give you two broad headings this morning. Ready? The first one is called secularism. Secularism. Now, secularism is an interesting word. It, it basically means separated or separated at, from, separated out from. And when we, when we talk about secularism in the sense of what it means in relationship to faith systems, to belief system, to the church, to, to the ideas of God, we need to put it in this context. Secularism has, in terms of a worldview, is an atheistic and materialistic worldview. It basically says that there is no room for God, and that everything that is, is in existence around you is all that there is, and it's all that there's ever going to be. It's a worldview that advocates for a public society that is free from the influence of religion altogether. And, and that's, that's the desire. And, and, and so it's a here and now ideology that lives for this world, believing that there is no next. The, the polar opposite of Christianity is secularism. And, and in many ways, what happens for them is, is that in, in their pseudo-intellectualism, they have allowed that science and all of their studies and all their, their mindsets have ruled out the existence of a creator, so they deny the existence of God. And humanism is the order of the day. The Humanist Manifesto in 1973 was written, and, and one of the phrases that came out of that was this, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. That's a humanistic philosophy. It elevates humanity to the highest level of anything that exists. And so, so that's the, the, the order of, of the day of secularism. They have cunningly crafted a system that is pitted against Christianity, and they base it on so-called intellectual positions, logic, and, and just the overwhelming what they believe to be evidence that what they're saying is true. Now, that's probably not exactly what Peter's referring to here because in that day, most everyone accepted the fact that something was a God somewhere. There were very few who just denied the existence of God altogether. But secularism is the mantra of much of our world and certainly much of the Western world that we're living in today. There's a lot of, of this going on here. So, you have secularism. The second broad heading and general heading I want to give you today in terms of cunningly devised fables is what I would call alternate belief systems. And by alternate, I mean alternate from Christianity. They're different from what we believe. They're different from the faith system that we embrace that has been delivered to us through the Word of God and through the presence and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and now continues to manifest and be revealed through the activity of the Holy Spirit of God in this world. So you have established ancient world belief systems, first of all, that are part of the alternate belief systems that exist. I'll give you an example of some of those. The Muslim belief system is an alternate ancient belief system. The Hindu belief system is an alternate ancient belief system. The Buddhist belief system is an alternate ancient belief system. All of these have alternate theories of deity, alternate explanations of time and eternity. There are occasional overlaps in some of those with what we believe, but there's a variation and a, and a, and a very hard turn away from what we believe at some point in, in every one of these. Some of these never even find themselves remotely related to the Christian faith and what it embraces and what it presents. 
So we have alternate belief systems that exist in different parts of the world and even in our own part of the world all around us. Cunningly devised fables. And Peter would have been referring to some of those. He would have been referring to the idolatry of his day, to, to the, 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 the Greek pantheon of gods that was so prevalent in all the different cities and all the different cultures that existed. He would have been referring to those kinds of things. He would have been referring to the, the, the variations of, of worship of deity in, in places far away. He would have been referring to those as cunningly devised fables, things that, that somehow people allowed to infiltrate into their minds and, and they began to, to develop these thought processes and move them forward into belief systems alternate belief systems. So you have established ancient world belief systems, but then you also have revised versions of Christianity. Even in Peter's day, there would be those who would come along and they would begin to challenge the nature of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They would challenge his deity. They would challenge the the moment that he was approved and, and determined to be the Son of God as a point in time whenever his deity then joined his humanity. They would, not, they would, not, they would question the virgin birth. They would question different aspects of the, the, the theology that was presented by the early Christian church. And they would then begin to devise different belief systems, different faith systems that were spinoffs from Christianity. And they would begin to identify these as, as truth and put those in the place of the truths that are the, the tenets of, of basic Christian doctrine. So this is something that, that continued forward. And you can read in church history and you can read in the, the history of, the, of, of, of Christianity how all of these things begin to, to take root in different places and in different ways across the world, the known world at that time. And so all of these variations began to formulate different, what we would call in our day, denominations. That's not really what they called them in those days. They just called them Christianity, but with a, with a twist, sort of. Different viewpoints, different aspects. And the theology was challenged in different ways. And out of that grew the, the Catholic Church. Out of that grew a lot of the other different churches that you and I know about in our world today. So this, this is, this is the, the, the variations of what we believe to be biblical Christianity. They would argue that they have the, the, the corner on biblical Christianity, but we say that we have it, and so we, in, we entrust ourselves to that belief system. Now, fast forward to where we are today. How, how, does, this, how does this relate to where we are today? Well, in, in our world, you, you, you learn of different uh, ideological, philosophical shifts that have happened. And we live in what's been known as, or called or termed, the postmodern world. You've heard that term. Anybody here not heard that term? Okay, everybody's heard the term postmodernism. Well, obviously what that means is after modernism. Modernism had more of a rational thought process. It, 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 uh, it was attracted by science. It was attracted by data. It was attracted by rationale. It was attracted by things that made sense and that were may, maybe more verifiable and provable. That's, that's more modernism. And, and into, that, into that worldview comes what we would call orthodox Christian belief. There was, there was some ability to find uh, syncretism there. That there. There was agree, agreement there in some senses about the, the need for fact and logic and truth as something that was verifiable and objective. And so you have orthodoxy that, that is a part of that process. And so Peter here is talking about what he says is orthodox, what he says is, is rationalistic, what he says is verifiable and provable as actual truth. And this is what he says about it. He says, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. We were there at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in his power, and we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, and we heard the voice of God giving approval to him, and we saw the glory of God settle upon him, and we, we heard the voice say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so what we have is this, this different idea here that, that comes to us from the word of God, and it's the, it's the, 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 the orthodox viewpoint of what Christian faith belief systems really are about. Now, here's the deal. We need to know 
about the cunningly devised fables because we need to have an awareness about the world in which we live. But we also need to know something else. Not only do we need to have a necessary awareness about the world in which we live, but we also need to have a necessary awareness about the word by which we live. Okay? We, we have to know both of these things because in order for us to answer the objections that come to us from the world or to present to the world a, 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 a right perspective, a, theological, a theologically accurate perspective about what we believe, we have to know the word that we live by. And so in order for us to, to have any, any compunction about that, in order for us to have any passion about that, in order for us to have any convincing, uh, convincing ideas backing up what we say, we have to know what we're talking about. We have to know the Word of God. We have to know it. It, it can't be just, just an addendum to our lives. It can't be like a, like a tag on the inside of our coat. that We know it's there we know a little bit about what it says, but if you had to, t had to test me on it, I probably couldn't tell you what it really says. And so we have to know the Word of God. Now, what happens is you have this, this reality that grows out of postmodernism, and, and, and what is attached to that is something, it's not, it's not the orthodox perspective of Christianity, but it's called neo-orthodoxy. It's a new orthodoxy. And let me tell you about that neo-orthodoxy. For neo-orthodoxy, here, here's something that you need to to go ahead and, and, and put down in, the, in your mind. For the, for the neo-Orthodox perspective, reality is constructed according to our interpretation of it. If we were in, in the neo-Orthodox mindset, we would say that reality is determined by our interpretation of it. Not, not by any objective word that comes to us, but by what, how we see things to be. And, and so we don't so much discover truth as much as we construct it. We don't find truth and live by it. We determine by our perspective what truth seems to be, and we pursue that. So truth is what we determine it to be. And this is the prevalent cultural ideology of our day. It's the prevalent cultural theology of the day. There is no objective truth. Now, I want to call your attention to verse 21. And this is what it says. Prophecy never came by the will of man. The Word of God is nothing that, that we have any say-so over. All we can do is read it, understand it, and allow it to speak to our lives. We can't twist it around and make it say something that it doesn't say just to suit the desires of our heart, the wishes of our mind, or the, the hopes that we have and how we live our lives. We have to follow this Word. And so what we need to understand is that the neo-Orthodox position says this Word contains the Word of God, but we have to dig into it and see what the truth of it is to me. But no prophecy is of any private interpretation. That's what Peter says. No prophetic word from God, no revelatory word from God is just for me and me only. If it has truth, it's universal truth. If it speaks truth, it's the same truth for you that it is for me, the same truth for me that it is for you. And we don't have a right, we don't have authority to go into this Word and to begin to make adjustments to it, to make it say something that seems better, more palatable, more pleasing to ourselves. We have to stand on this Word, period. So, you have that neo-Orthodox position, you have what is called the Orthodox position, and in the Orthodox position, here's the deal. I said this when I started. Christ is at the center, and everything else is just circumference. Christ is the center of the revealed truth of God. And this word brings testimony to our lives about him. This word brings truth to our lives about who Jesus is. And what Peter says about him is that he was revealed as coming in power and majesty and that, he is, and that this is verified by eyewitnesses, that it's affirmed by the holy declarations from the heavenly Father and that it's further attested by prophecies that have been fulfilled as presented in Scripture. And so over and over and over again, Peter says, this word is truth. God's word is truth. For neo-orthodoxy, the Bible is just a medium of revelation. What they say is it contains truth, and revelation depends on the personal interpretation of each individual. For them, truth becomes something that is more mystical rather than factual. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. And so I'm challenging us today, and I'm calling on us today to embrace God's Word as truth and to stand on God's truth. And you say, well, 
what's the basis for you to ask me to do that? Why would you ask me to stand on this, this, this book of words that you hold in your hand? What, what brings you to a place where you think that this book is so defensible? I'm going to tell you exactly why I think we should stand on this word. This word is inspired by God. This word is his word, and the interpretation of it is his. This word is the complete, closed, and sufficient revelation of God and his redemptive work through his son, Jesus Christ. It is God's objective truth, and it will stand when everything else falls. The word of our God will stand forever. Now, you say, well, how do I defend that? Let me just tell you a little bit about this book that you hold in your hand, your, that you hold in your lap, or that you're reading from your device or wherever, you, wherever you've got it. Maybe you've got it all memorized. That's better still. Let me tell you about this book. I'm going to just give you a little bit of facts about this book that, that, you, that you call the Bible. First of all, this book is composed of 66 individual books that were written on three continents across a span of more than 1,500 years by more than 40 authors who came from all kinds, various walks of life. And it is still a single unified book from beginning to end that reveals to us God's purpose, God's plan from creation till the end of time. And it's consistent in its content, and it's consistent in its intent. It contains detailed prophecies, hundreds of them that are related to the future of individuals, of cities, of nations, and of the coming of the Messiah. It's extremely detailed, and not one detail has ever failed to come to pass. Over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament alone exist, and every single one of those was met in that person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me talk to you about its authority and its power. This book has been preached and proclaimed for centuries and centuries of time. And where it's preached and where it's proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, let me tell you what happens. Lives are transformed. Lives are changed. They're changed by the power of God. It's accurate in its historicity. Its historicity is verified and authenticated now more and more by archaeological evidence and by multiple manuscript evidence. It's the best documented book that we have from the ancient world. Let's talk about the integrity of its authors. You have independent accounts, eyewitness testimony, surrendered lives, and even a willingness to die for the words they wrote down that you read in this book, and many did. Let's talk about its indestructibility. It has withstood and outlasted all attackers and all attacks over the span of time that it's been in existence. I want to tell you something. This book is a book that you would do well to hold right now as a light in this dark world. We face darkness closing in. It's closing in. And the light that we have is the light of God's word, the light of God's truth. It's a reliable collection of historical documents that reports supernatural events in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claims that these writings are divine truth, that they're absolute and, and inspired. And I want to tell you something. As believers, we must kneel under its authority, even as we stand on its authority. This is God's word to us. It's God's truth to us. Martin Luther and John Calvin, those ancient preachers and theologians from days gone by, said this, the first mark of the true church is the ministry of the word of God, the preaching of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Here we stand. Here we live. And here we die if we must. This is God's word to us. So, again, we do not follow cunningly devised fables. We follow the objective truth from the prophetic and fulfilled prophecies of the word of God as it was revealed to us in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who has offered redemption through his blood to every sinner who will come and kneel before him, confessing their sin, confessing him as Lord and Savior, trusting him to bring forgiveness and, and to provide through the work of the Heavenly Father adoption into the family of God where we have a place in his presence forever and forever. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So, Peter lays it out for us pretty clearly. With exposition, we understand it even better. And we come today to a place where this word 
challenges us to say, no longer will I live with the row, row, row your boat mentality. No longer will I be satisfied just to make my way merrily down the stream, being carried along by the current of world philosophies and mindsets and perspectives and ideologies because they are false, they're lies straight from the pit of hell, and I will not allow that to carry me. And if I have to go upstream, and if I have to fight it with everything I've got in the power of the Holy Spirit, I will do it. I'll do it. I challenge you to make that stand today in your own heart. Make that stand today. Whatever it takes from you, make that stand today because it's not going to get easier as the days go by. Maybe you're here today, and the first step, the first part of making that stand is for you to commit your life to the Lordship of Jesus, to trust Him as your Savior, to come to Him saying, I believe that you are the Lord. I believe that you are God's Son sent from heaven to bring redemption and salvation through your blood, through your work on the cross. I believe that. I believe that you died for me, and I believe that your blood is sufficient to atone for my sin, to pay the penalty and the price for my sin. And I'm coming today to say, I want to trust you as my Lord and Savior. I want to submit my life to you. I want to bow my life to you. I want to kneel before your authority, and I want to stand on your word. Please, Lord Jesus, save me. I want to promise you something. With everything that I've got, I believe it to be true. If you pray a prayer like that to God today, He will save you now. He'll save you. He'll forgive you for your sin. He'll bring life into your life where there was only spiritual death. Trust Him. Yield your life to Him. Maybe you're here and and you've been just kind of coasting along in your commitment to Christ and you know that it's time for that to change. You, you know that, that the, the pressure is, is getting more intense every single day. And you know that, that the, 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 the faith that you embrace right now, the position that you have, the depth of it is not deep enough to, to sustain when the storms and the winds of persecution or resistance or oppression begin to blow against your life. And today you need to say to God, I'm, I'm changing that. I'm coming to you and I'm asking you to take me deeper. To, to build my life stronger, to make me able, no matter what comes, to be able to stand and say, I'm a child of God. My faith is in Jesus Christ, and nothing you can do will shake that. Make that commitment today. If you're here and there's a need that you have for your life to intensify in some level, or maybe to begin to identify initially with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then I want you to know that there's a, a little card in the pew in front of you that we would love for you to fill out. We, we're not doing person-to-person, faith, face-to-face, altar call kinds of invitations these days because of the, the things that we face in doing that. And so we don't want anybody to get sick or make someone else sick. But what we will do is we will take that card if you'll fill it out, and we will follow up. We'll make, we will get a hold of you. We will contact you, and we will talk with you until every issue, every question in your life is settled as much as we know how to do it. And we'll pray for you. Let us do that. We'd want to. If you're listening to this message on the internet or watching it on TV, we have a phone line open that you can call. And there'll be somebody on the other end of that to talk to you and to help you, guide you through what it means to trust Christ, what it means to deepen your faith commitment to Him. Whatever's going on in your heart, we'll try to help you and pray with you through that. Just so listen to the voice of God and let Him speak to you. So for the next few moments, what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're just going to bow our heads and ask God to speak to us here today. And in the quietness of these moments, if God is challenging you in any way, please just take that card, fill it out so that we can pray with you, pray for you, know how to. If you don't want us to contact you, just say, I don't want you to contact me. Just pray for me. Whatever you need, we want to help address that need. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you now to continue speaking to our hearts. Amen.